Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here. This is a makeup lecture for group two who missed last week's radiology lecture. We're going to go over once again the structures of the lumbar spine uh, and the exact structures of the vertebrae, not only how they appear on just cartoons, but how they really look on different types of imaging like x-ray, CT, and MRI. So here we go. And if you want to jump ahead and search, the only slides I'm really going to test you on are the ones that have two stars on them. There just be there will be no MRI or no CT on your testing. Adjust the X-ray slides, but make sure you can identify the structures. If you can take all the little quizzes here with the with the X-rays that have two stars on them, you'll be fine. All right, here we go. So the objective of this PowerPoint is to refresh your basic spinal anatomy, which you should know pretty good by now, and to identify radiographic structures on the spine, uh, radiographic features of the spine on radiographs, MRIs, and CTs. This is also for my upper quarter, uh, eighth quarter students who need a little, little refresher before uh, hitting the uh, advanced lumbar differential diagnosis class. And just a note here, you doctors of chiropractic are experts in the spine and therefore you need to know this stuff just like spine surgeons physiatrists pain management and rehabilitation doctors do uh, you need to be up there so if, if you don't I mean if you don't know the components of the spine how can you call yourself an expert right all right let's start the very basics this is a radiology section now you're going to get this a lot more in depth uh, at our school but this is just a little kind of a taste of it and to kind of get you thinking about it. So x-ray is a form of ionizing radiation. It's a very short wavelength of light, uh, just like visible light, uh, only it's shorter than visible light, and it is considered part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Here's the electro. You had this in physics, I'm sure. So visible light, this is the light of the rainbow that we can see here. This is the, uh, the frequency of the light gets longer like a radio waves are very long. Now x-ray is much shorter, uh, not as short as gamma ray, uh, but it's it's dangerous. It can it penetrates body tissue, you can go right through your body and go right through wood, things like that. It can't go through metals like lead. This can go through even some metals here. That's very, very dangerous. Birth of the x-ray. So extra radiation or photons are produced in something called an x-ray tube. Specifically the x-ray is produced when speedy electrons, we know electrons right, we probably have that in grade school these days, they're very fast. What you do is you smash electrons into some type of metal target within the x-ray tube and the fast moving electron will hit the metal and stop suddenly. It causes the electron to release energy in the form of heat and x-ray. Note that x-ray tubes get very, very hot and this is because 99% uh, of the energy released is in the form of heat. Only 1% is in the form of uh, x-ray photons. This phenomena is called Bremsstrahlung radiation or breaking radiation. What happens to the photons? Where do they go? They fly around inside the x-ray uh, tube, but there's something that contains the x-ray tube, and that's called the columnator. And they are funneled out the front of the columnator. It's almost like the barrel of the gun you can think of it as. Let's take a picture of it. So here's the x-ray tube. There's a cathode and an anode, and you'll, you'll get into all this as you go through this uh, program. But this green thing is the columnator, and x-rays come out of a tube. It's almost like a gun barrel. Uh, and that's the thing you can, this the whole thing moves and shifts around and you can aim this. If you want to take a picture of someone's wrist, you aim it at the wrist. And we'll see, you put film or some type of photosensitive plate behind the patient to capture the photons that make it through. Not all the photons make it through the bodies, we'll see. Here's a real columnator here with handles, so it swivels around, you can adjust it. It's also got columnation on the side, so you don't, if you x-ray in the wrist, you don't want to blast the whole arm. You can narrow down the beam 
uh, via columnation here. Taking aim. We said this already. You aim the x-ray columnator at the part of the body, like the wrist, like you want to hit. Don't forget to columnate. That means to move the lead shields in to narrow the focus of the beam of photons. Here's kind of a here example here. So here's the here's the tube would be inside the columnator. You can't see the barrel of the gun, but it's aimed right at this lumbar spine. And so here's all the settings. There's KVP and mass and time. And you the photons come out. They go right through the lumbar spine. And then you have to have something to to capture the photons in the back. And this is it used to be radiographic film, but now there's just photosensitive sensitive plates. And depending on how many photons make it through, it colors this different shades of gray. I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Where do the photons go? They pass through the body with various levels of success. The ones that ultimately make it through the body will hit a cassette or a panel, there's different words for it, which is directly on the opposite side of the body. This cassette and panel, uh, these uh, contain, well if you still have an old school analog system, they contain real x-ray film just like the old type of film that was in cameras. And you know that's what I when it was that when I was in practice we used to I used to have one of these processors and old analog systems and you have to take the after you after you take the X-ray of the patient you have to go in a dark room just like photograph film and develop it and it's a big pain in the butt the new school nowadays uh, they have a photosensitive plate which is wirelessly connected well, it doesn't have to be wirelessly but it's wirelessly connected uh, to a computer that uh, that basically develops your x-ray without any chemicals. It's a lot more complicated, but that's kind of the gist of it. So when you load your film with, with or when you load your cassette with film, or if it's just a photosensitive panel, it has to, it's typically placed in something that the patient lays on or lays up against, and those are called the buckies. There's a table bucky and there's a wall bucky. Here's some old school cassette film, so you would open these up and put your x-ray film right in there, slip it inside the bucky. Here's a wall bucky that the patient would stand against. You're putting your photo, your photosensitive panel in, or it could be a cassette, same thing, loaded with film. It slides in here. It would look, it would be positioned like this, and then you line the patient up against that. So again, this is a, a table bucky here. You probably won't have one of these in practice. Typically chiropractors just have wall buckies. be nice to have one of these but they're quite expensive. Uh, but so for table bucky we would swing this thing around and maybe we take an A to P view coming down like this and there's the there's the uh, tray that you pull out and you put the cassette in there and slide it in. And here in this example here uh, they just have a cassette placed in a little holder behind the patient so they didn't even have to use the pull out tray here. Okay. There's a great system then. Again there's table bucky, wall bucky. This is the type chiropractors typically have. They don't. Our school actually has both of these which is wonderful. But typically you'll just have this set up so you can take standing films. So actually photons have the ability to pass right through most body tissue uh, and the ability to penetrate uh, to to move through body tissue is called penetration and photons have trouble passing through some very hard substances remember i said they get through the body with various degrees of success for example bone they don't penetrate through very good only very few of them make it through uh, but something like air uh, it's very easy to get through like your lungs. Uh, it can zip, photons zip right through that with no problem and, and hit the film on the bucky. So important little one star here. Radio opacity versus radio lucency. Very important concept. When photons get through the body and hit the film, they are turned into various shades of gray. The more photons that get through the body and hit the film, the blacker that region of the film becomes. That's a very important concept. 
right? And that blackness is called radiolucency. Oh, look at that radiolucent lesion in that patient's bone. Could be cancer. Another word, usually used on MRI, uh, is hypointensity. Oh, that lesion is very hypointense. So hypointensity is another word for blackness. So this is very important stuff to know. When photons have Oh, when photons have difficulty getting through the tissue, like let's say they run into bone, not many of them can get through all the way through the bone and hit the, hit the film in the back. Uh, then that region that is scarce of photons is more white. It's less exposed. So this whiteness is called radiopacity. Radiopacity. In MRI, it's called hyperintensity. Oh, Look at that radio opaque lesion in the patient's lung. Most of the photons got through and turned the lung black, except for that big white, maybe a lymph node or something. That's how you use the term. You don't say, oh, look at that white thing. You say, look at that hyperintense lesion, or look at that radio opaque lesion in the lung. That is alarming. Got it? So here's all the shades of gray. There's pure white, so the x-ray film, which is called a what? An image. The x-ray image after you expose, let's say, that wrist, it produces an image. That image could have very white regions in different shades uh, where, they, where the x-ray beam or where the photons didn't get through. Maybe around the edges of the hand between the fingers, there's no tissue, so it's going to be really black there. Okay, shades of gray, just what I just said. Radiographic image is commonly but incorrectly called an X-ray. X-ray is really the photon, X-ray photons. Really, you don't say, oh, look at this X-ray. But in reality, I mean, everybody calls it an X-ray. But if you want to be correct, uh, look at this radiographic image. Look at this MRI image. Look at the C. You don't say, look at this X-ray. Anyway. Uh, some regions of the film get hit again with lots of photons. Some regions get hit with little photons. Uh, and that causes the different shades of gray. Why? Again, photons penetrate the body tissue with various degrees of success. We talked about this already. So the body's made up of so many different types of tissue, and each has its own tissue density and hardness. Photons pass through in different quantities. All of the photons get through the lung tissue just about, therefore it's black. Hardly any of them get through the bone tissue, and therefore it has a very a low quantity of, t of photons make it through. And therefore the, the film is white. I think you understand this already. Let's look at some example. Here's a routine chest film with a patient with chest pain. What's pleuritic chest pain? You'll need to know this by fifth quarter. Might as well learn it now. Pleuritic. That means that they take a deep, a, every time they breathe in, it feels like someone's stabbing them with a knife. That's very, very painful. So, do you see the pathology? Well, let's look at this first. So, this is a, an A to P, or this is really a P to A view. You could also call it a coronal view of the chest. And you use different techniques. So, you the speed of the photons isn't great, so it captures more. Uh, you notice you can't really see the bones. I can see the bones superimposed, but this is called a chest film or a soft tissue film. So they, this, the photons didn't have a lot of speed and punching power because we want them to be absorbed more into the tissue. So for example, this we can see with the structure, this is a heart here. So it's more, it's more um, radio opaque, right? Not as opaque as this region here where the descending aorta is. That's because the photons have to go through the descending aorta. They have to go through the ver vertebrae. And therefore, not of a lot of them have made it through. Now, over here in the lung tissue, they've made it through much easier. And that's why this is, uh, this is darker in color, more radiolucent in color, or hypointense in color. Get the idea? Here's the hemidiaphragms here. All right, those are very strong. You'll see in gross. Oh, gross one or gross two? Gross two, we'll see these. Uh, they're very muscular structures, therefore they uh, photons have trouble getting through. These angles, which aren't very sharp, actually, they should be very sharp. These are costal phrenic angles. You always look here for 
a pneumonia or any type of fluid when the patient's standing up will accumulate here. So this patient actually has fluid in both lungs, more so on this side. And now do you see the pathology? Now I don't expect you to see it. I'd be very happy if you saw this. Uh, but notice the lung tissue. See these, this is the vasculature and these are all the bronchi, all the bronchial tree. And it goes right to the end here. This is the chest wall. Look at the side. Where's that vasculature? It's gone. And if you look very closely, you can see a line right here. So what is this? That's the lung. So the patient has, it's called a pneumothorax, uh, where maybe he, I'm not sure the cause of it, I don't see any chest trauma, but he, sometimes you can get a bleb, uh, which is a little hole in this, in this lung, and you leak air into the pleural cavity, which is a space between the chest wall the visceral and parietal pleura, we'll learn about that in gross too. But this is all filled up with air, so it's squishing the lung. The lung is, is collapsed. All right, let's look at this. Give you a second. You can pause it and take a look. Tell me what you see. What region of the spine is it? There's the sacrum. This is the lumbar spine. Okay, so here's the vertebral bodies here. Right? Here's the disc space. You need to know all this stuff. Now, obviously, this is a great example of something incredibly radio-opaque. In fact, this is 100% radio-opaque. None of the photons made it through the, this thing. What is this thing? This is an artificial disc replacement. It's actually a two-level ADR, it's called. I think this is a Prestige. Or, it's a Prestige, I think, or a Pro... Or is it... A, I think it's a prestige, but it's one. There's several different types of artificial discs in here. Uh, here's an, another. So none of the photons made it through. Therefore, the, the film is completely unexposed behind that. Get it? Okay. And some of you say, oh, my God, it looks like screws. And that is screws. This is an anterior lumbar inner body fusion with a peak cage. This is standard. This is not. These don't. These aren't working out so good, actually. I don't. I don't recommend people get these. So we'll talk about an eighth quarter. Here's another example. Now what do you see here? Well, this bone is more, uh, well, this these images are more radio-opaque, right? They're whiter. So more pho photons are having trouble getting through this patient's lumbar spine. This is a lateral view. Right? Here's the spinous processes. Here's the vertebral body. We'll talk about all that. Disc space here. I don't see any cages here. Um, so this is a normal spine. How about this one? Ooh, it doesn't look good, does it? Well, the photons are not having any trouble punching through this bone. Compare the color of this bone to this. Uh, so this is a patient with osteoporosis. Uh, this, the finding here is osteopenia. This patient is osteopenic. Uh, he's got, he doesn't have a lot of bone density. So uh, you see these, this is classic osteopenia. You have these whites, like somebody took a white crayon and colored the vertebral end plates in here. So osteoporosis, we got a slip here. We'll talk about this in a little while. This is a grade one spondylolisthesis. Can't really tell. It doesn't look to be an ismic or a type 2A, which we'll talk about. Anybody see anything else? Go oh, well. We got some Monkberg's medial sclerosis here. We got a little calcification in the abdominal aorta. Good. We got bone on bone here, right? So that's severe degenerative disc disease. You can call it uh, as well as arthritis, right? There's bone spurs. You can call that spondylosis. Something else. I know somebody in the first group actually caught this. Look at the spinous processes. What's happened to this one? Got an avulsion fracture here. Uh, so that's a fracture. You can see a lucent line through there. So got the supraspinous ligament has probably patient had a flexion extension injury and ripped a piece of the bone off here. Now what do you see? Oh, another chest film, right? There's the heart. Okay, so photons have more trouble here. Now you can see the actual the vertebrae. There's the pedicles. Here's all the ribs. 
We'll go into this more in detail in a little bit. There's the heart. There's the right side of the heart, left side of the heart, light left ventricle here. So very, look at the photons ripped right through here, no problem. They completely exposed the film. So very radiolucent here. I know everybody's going, okay, what's going on here? What in the heck is that? That is incredibly radio opaque. That's 100%. All photons were blocked. It must be, when all photons are blocked, it's got to be some type of metal. And it is. If you look closely, you can see this, this, this kind of curvy thing here, which is more radiolucent, right? That's a tube with air. What, what is a tube with air? It's the trachea. And why is it curved like this? Because there's something blocking it. So we got somebody swallowed a quarter and it actually got into the windpipe or the trachea. And it's causing, starting to cause an atelectasis, it looks like. Okay, you got the idea. All right, now let's get into the lumbar anatomy part here. And let's go over the anatomy we're going to talk about. Uh, the All the views, the axial view, sagittal view, coronal view. And by the time you get to 8th quarter, if you're an 8th quarter student watching this, you need to know this stuff cold or you will not pass this class. It's a spite. By 8th quarter, this stuff should be old hat. So make sure you know this. So let's talk about it. What the heck does the spine do? And remember, this is first quarter, too. So eighth quarter people hang in there. You know this. The spine, it supports the app the appendicular skeleton. So all the arms and the legs, everything attaches to the spine. It also transmits the downward force of gravity and the downward force of your head and your trunk. It transmits that through the sacrum, through L5's connection with the sacrum. So that's called axial load transmits axial load. It also allows for body movement, right? It's, it's where you bend and you twist and you rotate. That's called flexion. Extension is moving back. Flexion is bending to touch your toes. And you know what rotation is. Those are the three motions of the trunk. It also protects the spinal cord and the exiting nerve roots as well as the thecal sac. So there's a hole, the vertebral canal, which does that. And then it can, the, the basic, it's important, a lot of eighth quarter students didn't even know this. A lot of the, the basic functional unit of the spine is called a motion segment. You need to know that. Motion segment. And that is a vertebra, disc, vertebra sandwich. So here's a motion segment. Here's L3 vertebra. Here's the L3 disc. Here's the L4 vertebra, and these specifically vertebral bodies. Uh, but don't forget, this is the rest of the vertebra back here. Right? So we have a different, here's an A to P view. Here's a P to A view, meaning posterior to anterior. And uh, these are also, collectively, you could say these are coronal images, which is a view from the front. And this is a lateral view or a sagittal view. Right there's that auricular surface of the sacrum there for the auricular surface of the ilium, and that's the SI joint. Okay, muscles. I'm not going to dwell too much on these, but a lot of times when you're writing your soap notes, you just call these collectively the paravertebral musculature or the PVM. That's what that's probably good enough for your soap notes. But remember, we have the iliocostus. Lumborum here is the muscle to the outside. We'll be able to see these on MRI. And there, here's the longissimus thoracis. These go all the way down to the sacrum. Uh, the spinalis thoracis muscle is right here. It starts about at L1, sometimes L2, so it doesn't really go all the way through the lumbar spine. Uh, but those are part of the paravertebral musculature. Or together, these three are called the erector spinae muscles. See erector spinae muscles, and they go a long way. They go all the way up to the cervical spine. Very important muscles. You got serratus uh, posterior inferior. It's right here. We can see that in our specimen and lab. They can't really see the well. We can see the ex internal external obliques, but not this well. Right. So there's one more member of the 
actually quite an important member. This is stuck very firmly to the bone, to mammillary processes, and this is the multifidi muscle. There's actually a lot of research on this. Part of the pair of tibial muscles, but this is a really, when you talk about strengthening the core uh, to increase the stability of the lumbar spine, this is the muscle, right? This is a very important muscle. Then you got quadratus lumborum. It's this muscle right here. We can see that. The inner, I mean, these little muscles aren't that important to us, but the inner transversaris uh, group of muscles is important because we, uh, during surgery, you can actually use this as a bed. You can, if you want to fuse two transverse processes together, uh, you can use these inner transversary muscles uh, as a bed and you can lay bone graft material on top of that and it supports that. Okay, eighth quarter students, you need to know this picture cold. You might as well learn it now in first quarter as well. Uh, this is a motion segment. We talked about that. Remember that a nerve, you have a spinal cord. I'm not going to get too much into neurology, but I want to introduce this now. You have a nerve. The spinal cord comes all the way down to L1, L2. The nerve roots are embedded in the substance of the spinal cord. So you can't see nerve roots like this. But when you get down below L1, L2, they actually hang in, an, in the thecal sac. The thecal sac runs all the way down phragma and magnum all the way down to S2. Uh, but below L1, L2, you can see the nerve roots hanging in the thecal sac. And behind the vertebral bodies, they actually rip out of the thecal sac. That's called budding. And then they go around the pedicle and they come out the whole, the inner vertebral foramen or the neural foramen. Uh, and that is called, uh, after they unite, that's called the spinal nerve. That contains motor and sensory fibers. And the spinal nerve is very short-lived. Notice it splits into two components. It splits into an anterior primary ramus, which goes down, makes up the big, powerful, this case would be the femoral nerve. The sciatic nerve is also made by the anterior ramus. That's all the farther we'll go now. So that's really important. Uh, but this posterior ramus is important. And that's very short-lived. Posterior ramus in yellow here splits almost immediately into two or three pieces. The one I'm more interested in is this one right here, the medial branch. The medial branch, as you can see, gives life to the facet joints. In fact, uh, an L2 root spinal nerve the medial branch of L2 actually supplies its own facet joint and the facet joint below so very important you'll be tested on that you should be tested on the in this quarter it's a really important concept uh, but I'm not sure if you are but by the time you get to me you will be tested so make sure you understand that the the spinal nerve I mean I mean indirectly via the medial branch of the posterior ramus supplies the facet joints. So if you wreck this facet joint and you chew it up and you rip up the articular cartilage inside and it's a pain generator, well that pain is coming right down this medial branch here. That's the way the pain travels. There's procedures where you can burn this nerve uh, and eliminate that, uh, that pain. Although you have to be careful with that because this medial branch Notice how it does other stuff too, right? It's got these branches. These go to the multifidi muscles and give them life. So you burn this nerve via rhizotomy, the procedure's called. You're wrecking the, a little bit of that multifidi muscle above. All right, so make sure you know though. There's, there's a medial, there's a, now these are coming out of the plane of the page toward us. So this one is hugging the bone here. And these two are more, toward the tip of the transverse process here. So this is the lateral branch. This is the intermediate branch. Very important. And here's what we're talking about, the vertebral canal. Here's the thecal sac. It's important that you know it's also called the dural sac. Here's the holes where, uh, the punch-out holes, where the roots will, the traversing or nerve roots of the cauda will each leave to go do their job. I actually, or I didn't, but the artist actually removed all the nerve roots. Uh, all that you see here is the dura mater, which is the thecal sac. The rachnoid mater is 
very thin it's attached to the bottom so this is actually the arachnoid or subarachnoid space which is the thecal sac the thecal sac stops down here at s2 this is the phylum terminale which is uh, thought to anchor this thing what's this structure called conus medullaris thought to anchor that down and this phylum terminale which is pia mater rips right through uh, the end of the thecal sac goes all the way down and attaches to the the back of the first coccygeal segment here. Right, I don't think I need to say anything more, but you should know these structures, right? Conus medullaris is the end of the official spinal cord, and, but the nerve roots need to go all the way down, so they come out here of the conus. This is a very dangerous area. L1 disc herniations are big trouble. All right, that's enough of that. All right, let's meet the axial views. So here's the an overhead. This is an axial view. The mnemonic is hat, horizontal view, axial view, transverse view, hat. They're all AKAs, radiology, they use axial view. So notice how the bones get bigger as you go lower. So here's an L1 vertebra. Right. Make sure you know all these components. We'll talk about them specifically in a minute. L2 is getting bigger. L3 is getting bigger. Why are they getting bigger? Because more force. The further you go down, especially L4 and L5, the more axial load force uh, it has to endure. L5 has more axial load force than any place. Uh, therefore, it has evolved into a big creature. Now this one, some of you may notice, Look at the transverse processes. We'll go over this if you don't know what transverse processes are, but these are little airplane wings. There's the spinous process, there's the pedicle, vertebral body, ring apothesis. These are real bones, by the way. Look at these things. Why are they so big? This is not normal. So the artist or whoever put this together probably shouldn't have used this because they shouldn't look more like this. This is a transitional segment. This is an example of sacralization. This bone has taken on characteristics of the sacrum, so it's kind of a hybrid bone, half, half lumbar vertebrae. It's more lumbar vertebrae, but it's got some characteristics of the sacrum, in this case spatulated transverse processes. What's this hole in the middle? This is the vertebral foramen, I guess. If you're looking at just one bone, that's a vertebral foramen. Collectively, when these are put together, these form a tunnel for the thecal sac. And this is called the vertebral canal. Central canal is an AKA. It's not a good AKA, though, because there's a central canal through the center of the spinal cord. So that's not a good term to use. Make sure you know this. You need to know all these parts. So everything I just said but this is and this is how I explain it to my uh, you know my patients a vertebra has two components it's made up of a block of bone called the vertebral body in the front and then there is a arch like the St. Louis arch going over the back and that arch creates a space and a protective safe place for the thecal sac and spinal cord Thecal sac in the lumbar spine, spinal cord, cervical, thoracic spine. All right. Now this posterior arch is made up of several components. It's first it's hooked to the vertebral body by these pedicles. These pedicles are very strong. In fact, this is the strongest piece of the vertebrae. If you put this in a vise and crush it, these will have the most. It'll take more newtons of force to crush the pedicles than anything else. Uh, next we have these columns of bone like like pillars and these are called the articular pillars. They have a real articular cartilage facet joint on the top uh, and on the bottom. Those are the true articular facets even though you'll see in a minute we kind of have a slang word. Uh, a facet is another word for zygapothecial joint. We'll talk about that in a minute though. And notice there's a superior articular pillar and an inferior articular pillar. Where the two meet and where the pedicle comes in, uh, there's a weak area of bone. This is the weakest spot of bone, right behind the pedicle and right in the middle of the articular pillar. This is called the pars interarticularis. 
And this is the culprit in spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis in many types of them, not all types of them. Degenerative, dysplastic, there's different, are different types of spinal, but the one you'll run into most of the time is a ismic type 2a spondylolisthesis. Anyway, let's continue with this posterior arch. Then we have something that looks like a roof of the house. In fact, this is called the roof of the vertebral canal. And these are lamina. There are two lamina that are fused together in the middle, and that makes up the roof. Now, some authors say that the spinous process here also makes up part of the roof and it's fused in the middle. Others don't. Uh, so uh, I don't think it does. I think it's just an attachment. And then we have the same members on the other side. And then we have some attachments off this arch of bone. We have transverse processes or like airplane wings. And then this is like the, the rudder, the spinous process. If you put your hands behind your head and run your fingers down, you can feel that uh, quite nicely. Here's just another, uh, another image. I don't think there's anything new, except I did put the roof here. Uh, remember, the, the roof is really the lamina uh, together. And then the floor of the vertebral canal is the back of the vertebral body and the discs which we don't see here. And here we can see the superior articular facet. And that's, that's hyaline cartilage, just like the cartilage is around, uh, around the tibian, or around the uh, tibia and femur. So uh, it has pain fiber and it can be trouble if that gets wrecked. Here's just another view. I think I said this. Here's the root. This is an axial view. This is the root of the transverse process. That's new. Roof and floor. Vertebra foramen. I think we got everything else. Mammillary processes. We talked about that in lab. They're little bumps off the superior articular process. They're very, very deep, in my opinion. You cannot palpate these. Probably 99% of people. Uh, but there they are. Their attachment for multifidi. There's accessory process. Sometimes they're very developed in people. Attachment site for muscle as well. And all this yellow stuff, this is the this is the posterior arch. Ring apothesis, that's where the growth occurs in the bone. It has a little extra whiteness in it. Now this is important. So by the time you get to the eighth quarter, you better know this stuff or you're going to be behind the eight ball. So now this is a cut through the disc. See, this disc would sit right on top of this bone here. Oops. So let's look at this disc. It has two parts. It has a jello-filled nucleus propulsus, about 80% water. Uh, the cells, the nucleus, the nuclear cells produce proteoglycans, which are like little sponge bobs. They absorb water like crazy. And because of the pressure coming down, this would squirt out like toothpaste, or like a grape. So luckily, we have like a steel-belted radial, like the tread of a steel-belted radial. Uh, we have an annulus fibrosis, which is made up of about 20 things called lamellae. And it's uh, type 2 collagen. It has a orthodromic design uh, where the belts of collagen lay at, is it 45 degree angles to each other off the top of my head? I won't get into it that deep. Hopefully they should get into it that deep in class. And then the disc important here is the disc has the ability to feel pain. Uh, the sinovertebral nerve is innervates the disc. A long time ago, they didn't think the disc could cause pain, but now we know from radioactive tracing studies uh, that there's definitely the function of nociception. So if you rip your tread of your tire and this nucleus propulsus, especially if it's degenerated, gets into this outer periphery, it can cause an inflammation and some people cause horrible discogenic pain. I'm not going to get into that any more than that. Eighth quarter we will. I think I have YouTube videos on that already. But So here's the sinovertebral nerve in orange. Notice the sinovertebral nerve. I didn't draw in. I should have. As a matter of fact, I make a note to myself right now. To I have a more updated picture cartoon of this. Sinovertebral nerve also connects to the front of the thecal sac. 
So if you get a herniation or a tumor or something irritating the front of the thecal sac, it can also cause low back pain. Okay, uh, notice the sinovertebral nerve dumps into the ventral ramus. So a few of the fibers actually go down like that. Dorsal root ganglia should be on the other side, a student pointed out uh, to me, which is true. It should be more posterior. Uh, but most of the fibers of pain actually go through the sympathetic system, through the gray ramus communicons, into the sympathetic trunk up to L2, and enter the trunk through the, uh, the door through the sensory division of L2, which is very strange. I don't want to get too deep into this, though. There's our dorsal ramus, there's our ventral ramus, there's a spinal nerve. We talked about all that already. Uh, important concept now, when you're looking at overhead views, L1 to L4, you're going to see the, there's four ner key nerve roots that can get compressed by a disc herniation. You got the exiting nerve roots here and you got traversing nerve roots. These will become the exiting nerve roots a little bit below this, uh, but usually these are inside the thecal sac and protected by the dura. However, as you go down, these will bud out of the thecal sac. L5, they're already out of the thecal sac, so the traversing S1 nerve roots are out of the thecal sac. Some people believe they are more susceptible to injury because they're not protected by a lot of cerebral spinal fluid, they're kind of on their own. Um, sometimes at L4 you'll see them. In this cartoon they're actually butted out, so you can see them. All right, enough about that. And I think we talked about that already. Intervertebral disc uh, is named, how do you name an intervertebral disc? By the bone that sits on top of it. And it's part, the anterior disc and vertebral body is part of what's called the anterior column. When you have a anterior lumbar inner body fusion, you fuse the anterior column uh, with a spacer. It's made up of, of course, we just talked about that already. I don't need to say that again. 80% water, I talked about that. It actually supports in a healthy disc, it takes on 80% of the axial load. Facet joints take on 20%. Uh, when your curve is messed up, when you have a hypolordotic curve, it screws up the biomechanics and you can wear your spine out prematurely. If you rip the disc, the, the site where the axial load passes through is no longer the nucleus. It actually is on the posterior annulus, which is filled with nerve endings, right? So you get, can irritate uh, those nerves even more. We talked about the lamellae, and I talked about that already. Uh, what are the axial views good for? So, among a whole bunch of things, but disc herniations are really uh, easy to spot on the axial view. In fact, it's the only way, if you just look at one sagittal view, you can't tell whether it's a disc bulge or disc herniation. You have to look at the axial view. So, here's an example. Okay, here's an overhead view, just like, just like this. Oops, going the wrong way. Just like this picture, right? Keep that in your mind. Same thing. Now this disc is degenerated. You can't see the nucleus. But you can see the back of the disc. You can see the facet joints here. We'll talk about these in a minute. Uh, but look at this big black structure. So this is a patient who had an awful lot of leg pain. So this is a disc extrusion, which is one of the types of herniations. What else are the uh, the axial views good for? Well, you can look at the facet joints. Uh, so let's talk about the facet joints is all about chiropractors, right? We're experts in the facet joints. We find fixations or facet joints that aren't moving well, and we make them move through manipulation. And it's thought to maybe... There's no re solid research on this, but it makes sense uh, that if, if you can keep joints moving, it will slow the degeneration process because the joints require movement to help feed the articular cartilage, so it makes sense. Again, no great research, though. Uh, zygopotheseal joints support, we said that, 20%. They, actu they actually make up the posterior column of the spine. They're true diarthroidal joints. They have a capsule, synovia fluid, noceal septum. What's that? Noceal septum fiber? That's pain carrying fiber. They, be can, they can become stuck or fixated, and that's 
as I just said, they can speed it, that speeds the generative process. And that's what chiropractic is all about. It's the most common or second most common cause of chronic low back pain. What's chronic mean? In this country, three months. Pain that's been going on for three months. In the rest of the world, six months. I like six months better. I actually like four months better, but that doesn't kind of goes against the flow. There's something magical about that four month mark, but it's pain that's been around for a long time. Number one cause is a tear within the disc that is maybe herniated, maybe not herniated. Here's a nice cartoon. I modified it quite a bit, uh, but here's a facet joint. So here's the inferior articular process of which one? L3. And it's meeting the superior articular process of L4. Together they form the facet joint. And this isn't naked like this, it ha but it does have articular cartilage on the top of it. And they, this uh, facet, articular facet, of the superior articular process and articular facet of the inferior articular process meet to form the facet joint. And here's one that has a real capsule. But these are, we just said that these are innervated, have a double nerve supply, right? They're innervated by their own, uh, they're innervated by their own, uh, like L4 would innervate its L4 facet joint, uh, but it's also innervated uh, by the one above. So the L3 would also give a twig to this as well. All right. Here's the capsule around. Here's the body, vertebral body, which is deep into the page. Here's the spinous process, which is coming out of the plane of page. There's the disc. And here is the real, where the articular, or the inferior articular uh, facet would be. It's the same as right here. All right, so important to know that image. Now what are we looking at? This is x-ray, CT, or MRI. This is an MRI. This is an axial cut uh, through the L4 disc, and you can see uh, the disc. It's actually bulging. These should be have a little concavity here, so this is a good example of a bulging disc. You can't see the neural foramen here at all. The thecal sac is right here. This is a T2 weighted, so anything with a water content shows bright white like this. These are the nerve roots of the cauda equina right here. These are traversing nerve roots. Facet joint is right here, superior articular process. Inferior articular process is right here. Together they form the zygapothecial joint or Z joint, uh, or as it's commonly called in this country, the facet joint. Now it's not a good name because the facets are really the articular, it's really an inferior facet and articular facet and a superior articular facet. Uh, but we call these the facet. It's better if we could call them the Z joint or zygapothecial joints, but that'll never happen. Facet joint is what they are. So these would be the traversing nerve roots here. If this is L4, these would be the traversing L5 nerve roots. And these would be the exiting, same number as the disc, L4. So traversing L5 nerve roots, exiting L4 nerve roots here. IVF would be, you can see the little space right here, spinous process, lamina, there's all the parts. K articular facet is made up of everything I just said. So you can read that. But the whole facet, the same as Z joint, zygapothecial joint, this is the facet, this whole region here. Notice that the angles of the facet change as you go up. At L5, S1, they're very coronal facing, more in a coronal type plane if you're looking at an A to P view. This is an overhead view of them. But as you, by the time you get to L1, L2, they're more sagittally, they're more in the sagittal plane. It's very important. Uh, this design is important for stability. When this design is deviated from, it can be a source of chronic pain. You get a you screw up the biomechanics and you can overload one and underload the other. Uh, let's see, what else is axial good for? We can also use axial views to look for malformations of the facet joints. 
something called facet tropism. You're going to have a lot of patients with this condition. It causes a biomechanical dysfunction. Let's take a look. I'll give you a second. What is this? It's that same view we're looking at, but this is not a this is a CT scan. Okay, this is a CT scan. There's the disc right here. You got a little bit of bone coming through on this cut. Remember these these are cuts. We'll talk about cuts in a little while. Uh, there's the thecal sac right here. What's these? See those little things? That's ligamentum flavum, very little thick in this patient. But the point of this, and here's the slingshot. So uh, if this is L4, which it is, this is all L4 stuff. L4 spinous, L4 lamina, L4 inferior articular process. The only thing that's not L4 are these big things here, which make up the anterior and posterior borders of the vertebral canal. Um, so these are the superior articular process coming up from below. These are L5 property here. Okay, But the point of this is to look at the facet joint. This, how, how are they angled on this overhead view? This one is very coronal. That's normal. This one is too sagittal, so this is called facet tropism, something you're born with. It's a chronic pain patient. Uh, one of these facets could be the source of pain because it's been biomechanically destroyed because of this unevenness. Uh, disc facets versus chronic pain. Research demonstrates the number one cause, we said this already, of chronic pain is an annular tear with or without herniation in the disc. Close second is a dysfunction of the facet. Third place, maybe 10% of the cases, disp despite what SI Bone, who is a device manufacturer for fusion equipment for the SI joint, published some papers which I think are way out of whack. Sac at sacroiliac joint problems, probably 7 to 10% of chronic pain. Nothing like disc and facet joints. Let's talk about cuts. I've been talking about that. So when you look at an MRI CT, you have the option at looking through many different slices. It's like we put the spine in a in a meat slicer and slice it up into into many different pieces. And we can pull one of those cuts out and look at that cut. With X-ray, there's no cut. It's like your spine got squished flat by a steamroller, and you're looking at everything squished together. So for example. If you if you look at this is a CT contrast a CT myelogram all this white stuff you don't normally see on CT scan uh, but this if you like onus 2.5 this is from you can put this cut line this cut line pops up and so we can go through this cut line whatever this cut line cuts through it's literally like pulling a slice out and throwing it on the table and looking at it in an overhead manner. And that's what this is. So this is a cut not through the disc, right? The disc is right here. It's right through the vertebral body. And in fact it'll be through the pedicles. Why can't we see the pedicles? Where are the pedicles? Well because the cut is going right through the center of the spine. Pedicles are on the left and right of it so we don't see the pedicles here. Okay, but let's look at what that cut goes through. So this is the vertebral body. Here's the uh, the aorta here. Here's the vena cava, psoas major muscles. You can see the shadows of them. Vertebral body. So here's the pedicles. They they are part of the posterior arch. Uh, so here's the spinous uh, transverse processes. Accessory processes are here. Where's the facet joints? They should be right here. Where? How come we don't see the facets? Because we're cut right between them. This is actually the pars intraarticularis. This is the middle of the articular pillar. You get that? The spinous process is here. Multifida you can see quite nicely. Longus thoracis is here. Iliocostalis lumborum is right here. You can see their compartmental muscles. And most importantly the thecal sac. You can see it very nicely. See how it's covered? And you can see this is dye contrast material within the, th the thecal sac so it lights up all the 
traversing nerve or traversing nerve roots, which collectively are called the horse's tail or cod or quina. Okay, get it? Okay, you think you got it? Everything I said? Now take a quiz. Right? Everything I just said is right there. And you should also note that number seven here, that's the exiting nerve root. That's going to go out the hole a couple slices down. Uh, so that's already budded. Remember I said the nerve roots bud. Let's see. So this nerve root probably budded right about here. So they bud behind the vertebral bodies, but it's already budded so we can see it. That's the only tricky one there, I think. Okay, now let's look at this one. So here's a cut. It's not through the vertebral body anymore. Now it's going right through the disc. Okay, so when we look over here, there's the disc. Okay, the parts are a little bit different. Where's the pedicles? We're in between the pedicles. These are the IVFs right in here. There's no pedicles now. You can see this better on MRI. I'm sorry, the, um, this, these are the neuroforamen or, or intervertebral foramen. But now we can see the thecal sac still, spinous, lamina. Now, if this is a cut, which disc is this? What's the rule? It's the L3 vertebral body, must be the L3 disc. It conquers it. So the L3 disc, what is this property? Who, who is all this stuff? This is all belongs to L3. So inferior articular process of L3, lamina of L3, spinous process of L3. Uh, but who's this? Those are the superior articular processes from L4. They're coming up. We caught a slice of them. Together, what is this thing? Together, this is the facet joint. And it's got some arthritic change, doesn't it? We got a little bone spur growing off the back of it here. Okay, got it? See, it's not that hard. Think you got it? Take this quiz. Okay, nothing tricky there. Let's look at some MRI images now. It's the same type of deal. But now, MRI shows soft tissue better than bone. So this is, is this a through the vertebral body or through the disc? How do you know? What? where's the pedicles? It's not through the body. There's beautiful looking IVFs. I could drive a truck through those things. Those are the neural foramen or the intervertebral foramen or the IVFs. So this is a disc level axial cut through the L3 disc. You can see the nucleus as a young person. You can see the nucleus propulsus. You can see the annulus fibrosus very nicely here. Okay, you can't see the lamellae. We don't our technology is not that good, but there's 20 rings of lamellae here keeping this nucleus from squirting out the back. Now, importantly, it's a nice high quality image. Here's the slingshot or the Y in the back. So this property is all L3. I'm not going to go through it, but well, I guess I'll go through it. Inferior articular processes. Lamina, spinous process. This is again called the roof of the vertebral canal and the floor of the vertebral canal. Disc is bulging a tiny, tiny bit, but not... Usually they're concave, but it's this is normal. Now, importantly, the thecal sac... Now, you can't see it as nice as you could with the contrast in there. Uh, but it's right here. Sol cerebral spinal fluid, all this white stuff. T2 weighted image shows up white. Anything with fluid shows up white, including inflammation. So these are the traversing which ones? L4 nerve roots. Traversing L4 nerve roots. Who are these? Those are traversing L5 nerve roots. You can even see the S1 nerve roots down here. Right? These have not budded off out of the thecal sac yet. They're they're getting up to this butt off position though. They move up like they line up like airplanes on the tarmac, waiting their turn to take off, and these are waiting. Now where's the L3 nerve roots? Here they are right here. L3 nerve roots. Those are called the exiting L3 nerve roots. Okay. Multifidi, normal, a little bit of fat here is normal. These are normal looking multifidi. 
Think you got it? Take the quiz. Now, first quarter, don't worry about this. Eighth quarter, you better be able to know all these structures or you'll be in trouble. Right, just some more stuff. More quizzes. Think of another quiz. Now, so take the quiz. What's going on with this patient? Not a chronic pain patient. Come on, you eighth quarter students better see this. Should know this already. Look at the facet. Sagittal to coronal. Facet tropism. This is another case of one of these. Probably this one looks a little more beat up to me. One of these facet joints. How do you tell which facet joint it is? Eighth quarter students. Facet block. You can inject an anesthetic inside this. If this is the cause of the pain, if you inject an anesthetic in here, it better knock out the pain. If it doesn't, it's not the cause of the pain. Eighth quarter. Actually, what else are the axial images good for? Spinal stenosis. Tell my students, seeing you're going to be seeing more and more of this than I did. As the baby boomers get old, this is almost surpassing the rate of disc herniation surgery. Uh, it's a big problem. Let's look at it. Here's a recent client of mine who had horrible bilateral leg pain, couldn't walk more than four blocks without horrible pain. Interestingly, if he sat down, bent forward a little bit, the pain would go away. He could walk another four blocks. That's called what? Eighth quarter students. Nick, neurogenic intermittent claudication, almost always caused by spinal stenosis. Here's a pedicle cut through the pedicles. Okay, thecal sac. It's a little narrow there, but kind of a tight squeeze, little short pedicles. Uh, but it's fine. You can see the nerve roots hanging out here. Everybody's happy. Now let's go down a few cuts and look what happens. This should not change in size. Now let's look at it. Wow, what happened? It's completely squished. This is severe spinal stenosis, central spinal stenosis. Why is it squished? Look at these Groucho Marx eyebrows. What's that, eighth quarter students? Good. Ligamentum flavum has 20 times bigger than it's supposed to be. Severe ligamentum flavum hypertrophy. Squished the thecal sac from the back. Now this isn't technologist did not give me a nice cut down the plane of the disc. So I'm seeing bone, and I'm but I'm seeing a slice through the back of the disc here. So this is a bulging disc. It's crushing the front of the thecal sac. The lateral recesses are open, so this is not lateral stenosis. But what's in this region right here? Good. Traversing L5 nerve roots. So this patient has pain on the top of the feet. Their extensor hallucis is shot, no power in both sides. That matches the L5 dermatone. Got it? Multifidine muscles are also, and radiologists will never comment on this, but you primary health care providers or you spine specialists better look at this and say, better send this patient for some strengthening, right? Strengthen that core will help stabilize this. Eighth quarter students, you should also have noted this. So we've got a little ram, these kind of this ram sheep horn or this sheep horn, you know how ram has those curly horns? We got kind of curly arthritis here. We have a slip. Here's the superior articular process. It's supposed to meet the inferior articular process perf perfectly. We got a little bit of slip of that. That's called a degenerative. That's a type 3 spondylolisthesis. So we'll, we won't talk about that today, but I have videos on that, I think, already. Definitely eighth quarter, we will talk about that. There's another, what is that? It's another herniation. It's that same one, I think. How about the coronal view from the front? All right, now we're getting for your first quarter students are going to be tested on this. And your eighth quarter better know. Let's take a minute to look at this. What do you see? 
Well, a little curvature, that's not a scoliosis, but that's a normal looking lumbar spine. Got 12, there's the 12th rib. Always look for that. See, here's a normal, what are these things? Transverse processes, see how these are normal. They're always a little bit bigger, but they're not like that bone we saw. Uh, so this is normal. Let's go through the parts. So I always tell students, always look for the eyes and the nose. So the eye would be right here. Photons are having trouble getting through the thickest, strongest part of the bone, which is the pedicle. There's the other one. There's the nose. Okay, that's the spinous process. Lamina would be right in this region. Here's the articular pillar would be in this region. So just above the pedicle, actually superimposed upon the pedicle, we have the superior articular process right here by itself. It's meeting this. This is the inferior articular process. Spinous process again. Transverse process again. You can see the inferior end plate of which bone? L3. Superior end plate. How come you see two of these things? I saw some crazy chiropractor video saying I cured somebody's disc and look it was completely thin and now it's healed by my treatment. Well the doctor took the picture when the patient was acute uh, so when he got better the curve in his spine came back and he didn't take into account that these are both the inferior articular end plates. The disc is right here. You can't say oh this is bone on bone. Look you can't see this disc space. Like this one you can see a nice disc space here. But this, the disc is still there, it's just because of the curve. So here's part of the, the posterior articular portion of the superior end plate, and here's the front of the superior articular, or what am I saying, this is the vertebral end plate. So this is the front part of the end plate, this is the back part. But see how it's, remember this is x-ray, so you got run over by a steamroller. We can't see different cuts, everything's together. Uh, this big hole here is called the interlaminar space. That'll be on your test for first quarter students. Make sure you know ribs. This is this is 12 up here. Right, the vertebral body of T12. Where's its spinous process? Well, remember spinous processes are down low. So here's its spinous process here. This is the spinous process of 11. So these are the 12 ribs, the, the floating uh, T12 ribs. The shadow, so as major shadow. What's this black thing? Well, let's see. The photons got through that pretty easy, so it must be air or gas. So that's, that's gas in the descending colon. How about look closely here? You can see something. See the the border of it. Good. That's your kidney. That's one. Your, there's your other kidney shadow. It's called kidney shadows. SI joints. We talked about those in another video. Okay. They're they're at 45 degree angles, so you see multiple planes. First sacral tubercle. Nice one. Second sacral tubercle. All right. Got it. Everything I just said. So study this. What elements? The po Sometimes you hear this posterior elements. Posterior elements are just like the stuff on the posterior arch. So we have articular pillars are considered posterior elements. Lamina, spinous processes, not the transverse processes though. Why aren't they posterior elements? Because they have a different embryological uh, origin. So technically they're not grouped like that. It's from Bogduke, of course. He's the He's the he's the king. He's the gold standard. He's the god of lumbar spine anatomy. Been cited more than anybody else with regard to lumbar spine. Got some great books, as my students know. All right. So take the quiz. Identify the structure. Anybody see anything wrong? Pause the video and look real closely. Look. For, remember, look for the eyes. There's the pedicles. Give you a hint there. You can do it. Anybody see anything wrong? Say answers. What's wrong? 
Good. Some of you see it. Fracture. Look at this transverse. Look at this one. Fractured. Now what are we looking at? X-ray, CT, MRI. Can't be an MRI. You can't see the soft tissue very well. Can't be an X-ray because this is definitely a single slice through these things. What are these things? Vertebral bodies. We we know what that is. This is a this is a from the front. This is a coronal view. There's your psoas major. Kidneys. Vertebral bodies. So that's a cut through the vertebral bodies. How about this one? Matter of fact, let's do a quiz to see how good you are. What's another coronal? But now we've sliced deeper. Don't want to give it away yet. Some weird white things in here too. What are those things? Those are pedicle screws. This patient had a two-level fusion. What are those structures? Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to tell you the answers now. So, all right. Well, transverse process. See them all. Root of the transverse process. Root of the transverse process meets, well, this is all the articular pillar, this whole thing. Superior articular process, inferior articular process. What's in the middle? Good, pars intraarticularis. You could say articular pillar, the whole thing. What's this? Vertebral canal. Thecal sac, you really can't see the thecal sac. I'd prefer you say vertebral canal. How about this? SI joint. Okay. Pedicle screws in the pedicles. Pedicles would be also superimposed. You're getting a little piece. It's really the articular pillar. Pedicle would be in that area, though. Okay, there's your answers. What good are, who cares about these coronal images? Well, they're great for classifying scoliosis. We'll learn the Lenke system in eighth quarter. People struggle with that. I got a YouTube video on that. I suggest you read that before eighth quarter or look, watch that. How's this one look? What do you see here? This is a wicked Lenke 5C scoliosis uh, in a girl looks like she is I don't see riser sign I don't think she's probably in her late teens maybe early 20s even so pretty bad scoliosis probably geez 100 degrees maybe more very chronic low back pain all sorts of trouble cosmetic problems shoulders are pretty level though how come because it's a linky five it only affects the lumbar thoracolumbar region it's the thoracolumbar lumbar curve there's a little curve in the thoracic, but not very much. So this is this is a corrective procedure. It's called an anterior selective fusion. There's a posterior and anterior selective fusion we'll learn about to fix these things. Talk about that in eighth quarter. You can see the surgical staples here. Oh yeah, there's riser sign. So this is a younger person. You can see the C riser sign. The epithelial plate hasn't fused yet pretty good right got to you got to be impressed with that really straighten this procedure really can straighten things out well, I'm not gonna go off on a tangent there okay sagittal images very another important images here's the parts let's look at this one first vertebral body disc which disc L1 inferior in plate superior in plate see how you can see both sides of it like that x-ray See, here's the one coming out of the plane of the page to us, but here's another another one you can see. Sometimes you get a double, an x-ray. Our x-ray, everything is flat, so sometimes you can see both. Which IVF is this, the right or left? It's neither. Remember, this is steamrollered, if this is an x-ray we're looking at. So it's both the right and the left. Here's This is tricky, this part here. This is the transverse process coming out of the plane of the page. On x-ray, everything is flat. Sometimes we can see the other transverse process 
as well. So they look like double structures. Spinous, we know, inferior articular process, superior articular process, mammillary process back here, this bump. Don't think it's labeled. That's mammillary process. Neuroforamen. Neuroframina is plural. Neuroforamen is single. And what else? I guess that's it. What's the ligament in between, which isn't here? Intraspinous. What's the ligament on the top? Superspinous ligament. Oh, okay, first quarter. Better know all this stuff. See, it's not actually it's not that hard. Let's let you study it. You can take the quiz. I'm gonna go through these now, so you if you don't want to spoil the quiz, stop it now. Start with the easy one. Spinous process. Not enough. Of what level? Ooh, what level? Well, remember when we're palpating spinous process, if you go up one inner spinous space, mammillary processes will be there. So this is the spinous process of, here's the sacrum, 5, 4, 3, L3. Here's the L3 disc. What's this thing? Neuroforamen or inner vertebral foramen or IVF? Which one? Can't tell. It's both of them. They're superimposed. Okay. What else we got? How about this little nub right here? Superior articular process of L3. Inferior articular process of L2. Now be careful. Be careful. Give you hints coming out of the plane of the page. Right at us. Good. Transverse process. What's this? Another transverse process. See, this bone is twisted a little bit. The transverse processes weren't. When we squished it flat, this one was off kilter. Which one's closer to the bucky? This one. As you get away from the bucky, things get magnified and get bigger. So if I would have put a left marker here, which would indicate which side was next to the bucky, then this would be the left. This would be the right. Okay, what else? A little bone spur starting here. I think that's that vertebral body. Here's end plate, inferior end plate. Here's another part of it. Remember, steamrollered. This one happened to be steamrollered perfectly flat, so we can't see. But this one had a little curve in it, maybe a little schmoral node. Another one here. You can see both end plates. All right, you got it. There's the answers. Let's try this one. Now, give you a second to look at it. All right, I'm going to give you the answer, so if you're taking the quiz, you better stop it. So what type of image? CT, MRI, X-ray. You can see the discs beautifully. This is an MRI. In fact, it's a T2-weighted MRI, which is the one that you should look at. T1, you can look at proton density, fat, sat. There's all kinds of them, but we won't worry about those. What's that orange thing? It's a cut line, but I don't have the took the overhead view out for now. All right, so vertebral body, which one? Is that, is that five or who is that? This is a rudimentary disc. This is still S1, part of the sacrum. You'll see these on MRI. You can see it here better. You can see a rudimentary disc here. Remember, they by the time you're 20, you're all five sacral segments fused together. Right, so that's a cut through the L4 disc. This is the L4 vertebral body. Thecal sac, cerebrospinal fluid. There's the traversing nerve root, part of the cauticoina. Which disc is that, number two? L3 disc. How about number five? Interspinous ligament. Number four, there's a spinous process. So between is the interspinous ligament. And what else can I show you here? How about this right here? This black thing. What holds the roof of the posterior arches together? It's ligamentum flavum. Sometimes this can be this big. Sometimes it can come way out here. 
I can hypertrophy like crazy and cause central stenosis. CT, MRI, X-ray. So I'm going to spoil this. If you're taking the quiz, stop it. CT. Is it through the... Is it a mid-sagittal cut or a parasagittal cut? Mid-sagittal means a cut right between the pedicles. Parasagittal. Because I can see the intervertebral frame in here quite nicely. Okay, so let's go through them. Vertebral body. What's this? Vertebral body of who? L4. Number 8. Inferior implant. Superior implant. What about this space right here? It's the disc space, or that's the disc of L3. How about this? Number 7 and this. Very short. Right? They should be way longer than this. This guy's got congenital stenosis. Those are the pedicles. Right? How about this whole thing right here? Articular pillar, which is made up of a, this part, superior articular process. Number five, all this. Inferior articular process. Number four. Hmm, that looks weird. Well, it's meeting what meets the inferior articular process. Superior articular process. Which one? Or are they squished together? <clears throat> no, it's a right or a left. We don't know. We'd have to see the other cut. We need to see the sagittal to see where the cut line is. But it's definitely on one of the sides. All right. I think this is probably long enough here. We should be done here pretty quick. What are these lateral images good for spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis as well as degenerative disc disease degenerative joint what's one word for degenerative disc disease and degenerative joint disease spondylosis spondylosis I didn't put that in here what's this wow this is trouble right you're palpating this patient's back and you have a big hole in their back it's called a step sign watch out for those that almost always means that the vertebral bodies have slipped off their base which is the vertebral body below so this has slipped more than halfway looks like about three quarters of the way that's a grade three spondylolisthesis this patient didn't have an articular superarticular process so the facet didn't work so that's what caused the slip plus there's some we'll talk more about this case in eighth quarter uh, let's see. What's this one? Now, you fifth quarter students did terrible at this. You, this is a spondylolisthesis. There's many different flavors of spondylo. They're not all type 2, which is ismic spondylo. Type 2A is an ismic spondylolisthesis, where a fracture of the pars occurs. But the important thing to remember is you have to assess the degree of slip. So this one slipped less than 25, or close to 25, but I don't think it's more than 25%. So 0 to 25 via the Maillardian system is a type 1 spondylolisthesis. If it slips between 20 and 50%, so any slip, and you, you measure it by this corner here, to this corner. These are supposed to be like these. See, these corners are right together. There's no slip here. This corner is here. This one's way up here. So this is a grade 1, almost a grade 2 spondylo. Slips up to 50%, it's a grade 2. Past 50%, between 50 and 75 is a grade 3. Between 75 and 100%, it's a grade 4. If it slips, slips off the cliff, it's called a spondylopetosis. Some call it a grade 5 spondylo. Spondylopetosis is better. Got it? Let's quick quiz here. What's this? No, not ligamentum flavum. That's ligamentum flavum right here. Oh, it's splitting it. There's one getting ready to come out of its hole. It's getting ready to bud. This is the, these are all the traversing nerve roots hanging out. Collectively, they're called the cauda equina. This is the thecal sac. 
disk L3 disk. Now what's happened to this L4 disk? It's black. It's also thin. So significant degenerative joint disease. Look at this thing. What's that? Eighth quarter? You better know by now. If you're not, you'll know soon. That's called a high intensity zone or HIZ. What does that mean? Well, if you stick a needle in this person's disc, fill it up with a dye, contrast material, it's about an 85% chance that dye will leak right out the back of the disc. And research has demonstrated this is the meeting point of a full thickness radial tear and a concentric tear. Talk about that in eighth quarter. And what else do I want to show? I guess that's it. This is going to be too long. Oh, well, this is interesting. Eighth quarter. This is going to be on your midterm. Oh no, it's your midterm. This will be on your final. Well, the first quarter, you can see what this CT or MRI. Definitely CT. Sacrum is here. L5, vertebral body. L4, L3. What disc is that? L3 disc. Which hole was that? Neural foramen. Right or left? Don't know. Need the need to see the cut, the sagittal or the axial view to see. What's this? Inferior articular process. Superior articular process. This pedicle. Now the reason I put this up here. Oh, what's this? Superior articular process. This region. This is the reason I put this up. This is the middle of the articular pillar, pars interarticularis. See a difference? This is normal. See how thick and... I mean, it's still weak, but it should be... This is a normal shaped one. What the heck is going on here? Why is this so skinny? Look at this one. Oh, it even looks there's a disruption in the cortex there. Oh, look at this. Check the corners. What do we got? Grade 1, grade 2, grade 3... It's grade one spondy or spondylolisthesis. How about this one? Well, there's the corner there. This one slipped as well. There's another grade one spondy. Two double spondylos. What's this one? Look at this one. Is that a retrolisthesis that's called? But not really. It's because this bone is slipped forward. I think this is in position just fine. But what's going on here? This is this is called a type. 2B spondylolisthesis. So it's an ismic spondylolisthesis. Well, ismic means fracture. I don't see a fracture. I, either do I. The fracture has healed and it's fractured and it's healed and it's fractured and it's healed and it's made this really thin and long. See how long this is? Looks like a greyhound. This is called greyhound sign. Uh, so this is still considered an ismic spondylolisthesis, but it's a type B, meaning you happen to catch it when it healed. You see this in gymnasts, and especially who fractured their their pars and it's healed, and they went back to gymnastics and fractured again, repeated that cycle several times, and it, it turns into a very vulnerable. And this every time it heals, it can be filled with pain-sensitive nerve fiber. All right, are we done? Mayarding system. There's we already went through that. So you use the back corners here. There's the back corner. So this one is slipped. This is, they should have made it a little closer. But anything from zero to twenty-five is a grade one. Twenty-five to fifty is a grade two. Fifty to seventy-five is a grade three. Okay. Oh, guess we're not done. We're almost done. Uh, so there'll be a couple thoracic images as well exactly the same as the lumbar images except for these things so you have some facets for the articulation of the ribs so these are called transverse costal facets these are called uh, inf there's an inferior and superior costal demi facet and those are for articulations of the ribs here's a better view so the superior costal demi facet Inferior costal demi facet. You can't really see these on x ray though. This is just for anatomy here. Transverse costal facet. 
L1 would only have one. I'm sorry, T T1 would have one. Same with same with T11 or no T12 both have one. I forget that. Better check that off the top of my head. Um, and note, notice the spinous. Remember we did that in lab? That Dolly Parton 9 to 5 rule. You go up two interspinous spaces and over to find the TP. But look at the, the how how far the TP, that's where you palpate. Look at how far the TP is up from the spinous process. There's a few from the back. You can see the articulations of the ribs here. But again, look at the spinous process. Look at how far the, uh, let's do number nine. So you go up one inner spinous space, two inner spinous spaces, and out a couple centimeters. There's the TP and the rib. And that superior uh, demi facet. Can't really see it though. So two stars. Make sure you can find these structures. This will be on first quarter of your test as well. So what's that? So I'm going to give answers, so turn it off. Well, I don't see any ribs here, but that's a rib. So that must be the 12th rib. So it's a posterior 12th rib. And you know the part. I'm not going to go through these again. Pedicle, lamina, spinous, interlaminar, kind of bubble here, superimposed over the vertebral body. How about this? What's this? It's posterior rib of, got to make sure you say of, T11. Patients are a little osteopenic, aren't they? It's looked like somebody took a white crayon and drew there. All right, you can find that other stuff. Well, some of you might want to get that. Okay, now we're really going to, let's talk about, see, no, we're not going to get into this. But it can get incredibly complex, though. You can see this is probably, oh, T3, T4. T5 maybe need that side view to tell for sure but you can see the articulations with the ribs transverse process and vertebral body what's this you know this CT is similar to x-ray photons have zipped right through this material really easy turned the film black completely exposed the film these are lungs right these are vessels within the lungs this is a contrast how about this big thing that's your aortic arch right there. We're not, you don't need to know that, though. Scapula. Maybe gross, too. Maybe I can put that in gross, too. There's scapula. Sternum. All right, that's enough. Went way too long. But if you understand everything I said in this, you, you're you going to be really good with respect to the lumbar spine. Thanks for watching. There's some references. See you in the next video.